You know, I talk about a lot of weird RPGs. When you think of a role-playing game, the first thing that comes to mind is probably something like your Final Fantasies or Dragon Quest, if you're one of the five Americans that like Dragon Quest. And as cool as those games are, it's nice to get an RPG that shakes things up and plays things differently. Earthbound is the most notable example of this. I'd like to think that most people who've spent a couple of seconds online or played Smash Bros know about this game and the Mother series as a whole. And plus, anytime I talk about weird RPGs, I'm obligated to bring up Earthbound. It broke boundaries for the genre by not taking place in a medieval or fantasy setting and opting for something more familiar to us. It was a game about kids with psychic powers going on an adventure across the country fighting wacky enemies like dogs, trees, taxis like an average 90s kid would. All in an effort to prevent an alien invasion. While I initially underperformed here in the West, well, you should know what happened. It garnered much more attention over the years and soon became somewhat well-known. The game really struck a chord with a lot of people, including yours truly, some folks being inspired by the odd nature of the title to create their own unique games. Earthbound is a very inspirational and influential game, and in the past decade, we've seen that inspiration bear fruit. I know that quirky Earthbound-inspired indie game about depression is a joke more common than cockroaches in a Taco Bell, but there are a lot of games out there where you can tell the devs are probably huge mother fans. Nothing wrong with that, though. All of the ones I've played have a couple of things in common, such as silly humor, yet paired alongside weird and sometimes disturbing and dark stories, and yet they each have plenty of other aspects that make them stand out. Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass, Omori, uh, Citizens of Earth, though that one is not really dark, unless if you find politics really scary. Freaking yick. Oh, soon enough, yick, soon enough. And there are plenty more Earthbound-like games out there. What I just listed off barely scratches the surface, but if you've watched my channel before or have had the misfortune of speaking to me, you'd know that out of all of them, Lisa is my favorite. Lisa the Painful is an RPG made with the RPG Maker game engine developed by Austin Jorgensen, or Dingaling, and released in late 2014. The game follows a man named Brad Armstrong exploring a post-apocalyptic wasteland where women have gone extinct in search of his adoptive daughter. And with a concept like that, it should be pretty obvious why I love this game. Like seriously, a world without women? No, women! I must say, that was a worthy trade-off. Now, Lisa is actually a follow-up to Dingaling's first game, Lisa the First. I've never played the game before, but I watched a plot synopsis of it in a bar one time. The sound was off, but I think I got a basic gist of what was going on. Uh, it was an exploration-focused game similar to Yume Niki, and not a very well-known one at that, but I feel it's important to mention for story reasons. I'll bring it up whenever it becomes relevant. Anyway, Lisa the Painful is completely different. It's got a different perspective, actual battles, resource management, and a much bigger story. The game begins with Brad as a child getting bullied and taking the beating for one of his friends. After the bullies finally leave him and his friends alone, Brad goes all the way home to his decrepit house and we get introduced to his father, Marty. Marty is an abusive alcoholic who doesn't have any problem berating and throwing bottles at his own son. He insults his kid for getting beat up and the whole scene ends with Brad going upstairs to his room and breaking down crying. The game fast forwards several years later, and between that time, a lot happened. Brad eventually got out of the household, but couldn't leave with his baby sister, Lisa. In this time, Lisa the first story would take place, and Lisa, now by herself, would suffer from Marty's torment alone. Eventually, she couldn't even escape into her own mind without being haunted by him. At a certain point, Lisa would no longer be able to bear the pain anymore, and eventually committed suicide. Many, many years after all that occurred, the whole world sorta went to shit. Some time ago, a mysterious Great Flash hit the land of Olaf, and afterwards, it became a wasteland. Women disappeared, the day and night cycle is screwed up now, and in a society with a severe lack of women, there are a lot of horny guys out there, and porn magazines eventually became the new currency. I cannot begin to imagine the exchange rate. One day, out of sheer chance, while he's taking some drugs alone, Brad finds a baby girl in the wasteland. 
Oh, well, fuck. Brad brings her back to his friends, and needless to say, they're all shocked. They try to convince him to give the girl up to the Rando army. Rando is known to be a very powerful warlord, and probably the only ethical gang in Olathe. But Brad refuses, and insists on raising the girl himself, despite the dangers that could come from people finding out that you have the last human female on Earth. And he commits to it. The game plays this long cutscene afterwards showing Brad and his friends raising the girl and keeping her a secret. And they name her Buddy. Uh, yeah, by the way, a uh, common misconception. This is not Lisa. This is Lisa. This is Buddy. Uh, Brad struggles as a father, trying to give up his addictions to alcohol and a drug called joy for her sake, while also keeping her hidden from the dangerous world, which begins to take a toll on both of them. But Brad still tries his best to make her happy, despite the very unfortunate circumstances he's working under. Eventually, though, he caves in and goes back to his old habits. Then he wakes up the next morning and saves a guy's life from a dog. What the dog doing? Upon returning home, he finds one of his friends dead and the hut a bloody mess, and Buddy is now missing. Realizing that the last girl on the planet has now been found out by the violent and sexually depraved world, Brad now goes on a painful little adventure to find her. So as soon as you take a look at the game, you might notice that it's significantly different than most other RPGs. A lot of these games, especially ones made with RPG Maker, have an overhead perspective. Lisa, on the other hand, has a perspective similar to that of a 2D platformer, and while that might sound like it's limiting your options on where you can go, this game has some of my favorite exploration in any RPG ever. Brad can jump up and down ledges, climb ropes, and later gets access to a bike that allows him to clear gaps as well as increase his movement speed. Because of this pseudo-platformer approach, getting from point A to point B can almost be a puzzle in itself. There will be moments where you really have to think hard about how to safely progress. I say safely because this game also has fall damage. Now, fall damage is a bit of a touchy topic and something people typically don't like, but here, I think it works great. Ah! If you jump far enough off a ledge, then Brad will take fall damage. The farther you jump down, the more damage you'll take. The bike will let you get away with jumping down farther, however, it has its limits also. Sometimes you'll have to bite the bullet and take some damage to get to a certain area, and occasionally you'll have to take a big hit in order to get an item. Scavenging for items is really important considering how dangerous a life is, and there's not a lot to go around, so you should go out of your way to pick up everything you see. Thankfully, there are plenty of goodies to find in all sorts of nooks and crannies, such as porn mag stashes, you can find bottles on the ground that have various uses, such as being used to make explosive firebombs, holding soup, very important, let me tell you, and you can even take after your dad and chuck them at people. There is a lot of stuff you can grab, even things that look like they're just there for environmental details might actually be pieces of equipment you can pick up. In battle, you have access to a wide variety of techniques, some of which you may or may not have seen before. Brad, as well as a few other other party members can use a combo dial as part of their normal attacks using the WASD keys. And every character also has their own list of special moves that you can use by choosing from a list, standard affair. But what makes the combat in this game so much more interesting is that you can pair these two different types of attacks together. Now you can just press random buttons like in a fighting game and unleash a bunch of regular attacks, but each special move also lists an input in its description. When you input this into the combo dial, it triggers that respective special move and makes it do increased damage. It's really satisfying watching Brad unload into an enemy and then capping it off with a drop kick or boot like a dukin. I mean, the animations in general are great across the board. And as for the rest of Brad's party, that's another thing I love about this game. There is such a wide variety of characters you get to use here. Most RPGs have pretty condensed parties, usually ranging from like four to eight characters. Lisa has 30. Almost all of them are completely irrelevant to the story, and you're only required to get like four of them. And that's what I love. See, a lot of these guys are optional. You get the rest of them by exploring the world and completing side quests, such as finding hidden locations, getting them certain items, beating them in a fight, listening to them talk about Tom freaking Fortnite. Fortnite. And they all have their own array of unique attacks, strengths, and weaknesses. There are so many of these guys that I can't even begin to detail every last one of them. This was my fourth playthrough of the game, and while I have gotten every party member before, there are still several I've never 
ever used in battle. I've got a lot of favorites, such as Olan, a fellow with a bow who always makes for a solid early game option. Piss. Mad Dog, who's got good stats across the board, bleed damage, and he complements well with a lot of other characters. I used Percy for the first time, and while he has weak damage, his fire attacks are actually really strong and seem to almost always proc a burn, and he's got decent healing to boot. Now, with that said, there certainly is a giant gap in viability between some of these guys. A Tiger Man is the most notable example of this. In order to recruit him, you have to beat him in this ridiculously hard boss fight that goes on forever and can quickly end in a loss. And when you finally get him... He does alright, but then you realize he has a joy addiction, and now he's doing no damage because he hasn't had his daily dose of blue chalk. A couple of characters suffer from joy withdrawal. Joy is a drug distributed throughout Olathe, and this includes Brad. We'll talk more about it later. Uh, but yeah, point is that Tiger Man sucks, and bro shouldn't wear a fursuit in the scorching hot sun. If there were any bitches left, then he sure as hell isn't getting any of them. And then, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have some overpowered fellows. Birdie is my favorite party member in the game. He's the most drunk off his ass kind of guy I've ever seen and he uses that to his advantage. And the only action of his that matters is gasoline spit. That alone completely breaks him. This move can not only make the enemy blind and more likely to miss attacks, but also extremely vulnerable to fire damage. And there are a lot of strong fire users in this game, including Brad. You can absolutely shred ass with this technique and he's also got a party wide heal to boot as if he wasn't strong enough. You get all of this by simply giving him some whiskey, which isn't that hard to get a hold of anyway. Then there's Fly, who admittedly takes a lot more effort to recruit as you have to visit this completely optional area and complete this kart racing minigame that'll give you carpal tunnel or destroy your space bar, preferably both. But dude has strong whitey <laughs> whitey party damage. But dude has strong party wide damage and more importantly, broken puke. Yeah! This induces random status effects on the enemy, and in most cases it ends up completely immobilizing them with a few action stopping effects, and maybe you'll get a poison off too. Lisa is commonly touted as a tough as nails game that will repeatedly beat your balls in, and don't get me wrong, it does do that, after all there's a good reason why I can't have children anymore. But the game can also be easily turned on its head, and with the right strategies, even the most threatening foes can be turned into complete jokes. With that said, however, while it is fun having two guys constantly vomiting on everyone while a fish is purposely spreading misinformation about your opponents, and going on a fun, silly adventure with a bunch of weirdos and seeing how crazy this world has gotten, Every now and then, the game likes to kick your teeth in and shove a cactus up your butthole. There's a very good reason why there are so many party members, and that's because they're a lot like children, which means they're very expendable. There's a part of the game where you're forced to play a Russian roulette mini game, and bro's lying, you don't have to play three rounds, you have to win three rounds. Maybe you could get lucky and escape just fine. Or maybe you could have most of your party members up to this point get killed by sheer chance. Or you could be like me and have Giga Chad Farty sweep everybody all on his own. And if you want to, and you got plenty of lives to spare, you can always come back later and push your luck to get some more mags. It's not just this minigame where your allies' lives are on the line. You can't even find a safe place to sleep easily. In most RPGs, when you need to heal up, you'll stop by an inn or whatever to heal off all the damage you've received from grinding enemies and exploring in dungeons. In Lisa, however, the most common resting spot are these campfires. You can rest at these campfires and get fully healed, however, on some occasions there might be a caveat to this. Such as possibly getting some items stolen while you were sleeping, getting poisoned by a really mean spider, or even having one of your party members outright kidnapped. And you can hunt down the gang that took your guy, but they won't fork him over unless you've got the mags to spare. Just be careful because depending on your decisions, they'll go ahead and kill their hostage before you have the chance to save them. I swear guys, I intended to at least keep Terry alive for the rest of the game. I gave up some beef jerky to save his life earlier after all, but Butthead over here took my lunch money a few minutes prior and then I didn't have enough porn to save my boy. But I tried. Speaking of dangers to you and your party, out in the world you'll occasionally stumble across a deformed human being and a lot of these mutants are hostile. They aren't just tough, but incredibly dangerous, sporting lots of health, powerful attacks, and the ability to insta-kill characters. And I don't mean one shot. I mean, they straight up kill them. It's 
horrifying and startling when it does happen due to just how rare of an occurrence this is. I never had this happen on my first playthrough, and to this day, they still catch me off guard. Like, bro, I was using my dude Percy the whole game. After I saved him from that spider trying to crawl up his poopy hole, we were friends for life. However, during the epic battle on the snowy mountains, Peter, the mutant, broke his fucking neck. Peter, how many times do I have to tell you to not do that? However, if you manage to beat a mutant, or any strong enemy for that matter, you're rewarded with a ton of EXP and possibly some good items as well. That's the key with Lisa. You need to explore every square foot of the land to help you prepare for the road ahead. The game doesn't make it clear all the time where you have to go to progress, so sometimes you'll find yourself doing something completely unrelated to the main story without even knowing. And in this case, at least, I think that's a good thing because all these side quests reward you with so much stuff, so many party members, and tons of areas you would probably miss out on if the game told you where to go. And they're fun too, of course. The game really opens up in Area 2. There are like two sections you have to go to, and several others that are completely unrequired. I'd go as far as to say that half the game is actually optional. And if you go out of your way to explore, then you'll be able to handle the road ahead just fine. Lisa isn't just a game where you can run around in one area and grind the EXP, then throw yourself at a brick wall in order to progress. I mean, you could do that if you wanted to for god knows what reason. There are random encounters in some areas, but the enemies are so basic and the stuff they give out is so pitiful that you might as well not even bother. It's much more beneficial to fight optional bosses and get loads of EXP and goods for defeating them. One of my favorite things about this game is that almost every fight feels important. Outside of the mysterious figures and the snakes and stuff, almost every enemy in the game is unique and has their own actions and dialogue. And you have to plan out your strategies and care carefully use your limited resources to get past them. It really makes each encounter feel like a special event unlike other RPGs where you beat up the same crab 50 times. I feel like the game starts out a little tough in Area 1 as you're pretty limited on what party members you can use and most of the ones you can get at this point take a little bit of growth to get the ball rolling, especially Terry which might initially turn you off from him. Any hit you take hurts all the more as you don't have much health to work with, items are scarce this early in the adventure and there aren't any safe spots to rest so you have very little to fall back on. The early game bosses are incredibly intense and tough fights where everything could go wrong at any second if you aren't cautious, but once you get to area 2, things will start to ease up, the world opens up, and now it's your job to make it your oyster. Throughout Brad's journey, he'll occasionally come across a man going by the name Buzzo. Buzzo really has it out for Brad, looking to punish him for an unknown reason. On occasion, he'll even toy with Brad by forcing him to make very gruesome decisions. The most iconic of which forces Brad to make the decision between getting a party member killed or losing an arm. I mean, we could try to fight him. <laughs> Well, at least Olan survived. If you decide to lose the arm, then that does affect Brad. His stats get lowered and he'll lose access to some of his combos. And if you lose the other one, then he'll get even weaker and be unable to use combos altogether. And he'll look really cute when he's on the bike. Not only that, but Brad will become more dependent on Joy. It's about time I get to this. Uh, according to my script, Joy is a drug is a drug that Buzzo and his gang distribute. Brad and many others in a life take it in order to deal with the pain of the harsh new world. And for Brad, it also helped him cope with the trauma from living in Marty's household. A joy isn't just a plot point, however. It also ties into the gameplay. Every now and then, the screen will flash red, typically when you're just walking around or when this guy points at you. Okay, no, I'm joking about that last part. That was just really good timing. When this happens, Brad starts suffering from joy withdrawal. In this state, his damage is severely reduced to the point where he's almost as useful as a used condom, with only his fireball attacks doing any decent damage. However, you can also find plenty of joy throughout the game, and when a character takes it, they'll become insanely strong, doing critical hits with every attack and being able to tank damage better than ever. But it's better to just not take it, and that's not because it's a limited resource. Brad had been trying to get over it himself for Buddy's sake. Certain other party members also suffer from withdrawal, as I mentioned earlier, and in a lot of cases, it completely ruins the character, but with Brad, I feel like you can definitely make it through without Joy just fine. But when the going gets rough, should you cave in and pop a Joy, or should you help Brad stay clean? The choice is yours. But let's not dwell on depressing stuff like that. Something pretty common with Earthbound-like games is that they're pretty light-hearted and goofy for the most part, and then every now and then they hit you with something really heavy, yet they always strike a good balance. Lisa is no exception. This game is really freaking funny, 
at least to me anyway, and uh, I may or may not have a pretty poor sense of humor. Your Honor, my client says that he is innocent of this crime, but he is guilty of saying, you suck eggs. <laughs> your wife's eggs. <laughs> this blends into the music as well. I really love this game's soundtrack. It's unlike anything you'll ever hear for better and for worse. You have songs such as the Beehive, which I've always found surprisingly relaxing. I find it nice to just chill out here. And on the other end of things, you have Work Harder, which samples a grunt sound effect from Shinmu 2. <laughs> And of course, the game nudges its way into the disturbing territory. The mutant battle theme is unsettling in itself and makes those fights all the more nerve-wracking, but then there's, I hate this title, Blood for Sex, which plays in a few select locations, and I'm going to say straight up that it's the freakiest song I've ever heard in a game. Sometimes when I'm walking downstairs late at night and all the lights are turned off in my house, this song creeps in from the edges of my mind and then the lemonade stand opens for business. And there were more than a few moments where this game gets actually scary. I found myself jumping at the sight of an enemy showing up out of nowhere, and some of the locales you stumble across are so foreboarding that I couldn't stand to be there longer than necessary, even if I knew they were safe. I adore games that can make me feel such a wide array of emotions, and Lisa does just that. The cherry on top of all of it, however, is the story. I'm not gonna go too deep here because I've done that a lot in various different videos on my channel, but Brad goes through so many different struggles as a character, at one point you might be rooting for him and then a few hours later he'll do something that might make you tilt your head or reevaluate your perception of him. Buzzo is a disturbing dude with incredibly questionable motives, every single scene with him is more unsettling than the last, and as if there weren't already so many different mysterious characters, where the fuck does Lisa herself even fit into all this? Well, a lot of those things are left a mystery, at least in this game. And while those will get solved at a later date, this is Brad's story, and I think it works wonderfully. Not gonna get into spoiler territory here, however, trust me, I tried writing about the rest of the story, and I found it really hard to put all of my thoughts into words. What I will say is that the last half hour of the game might just be the scariest finale I've ever seen. Like, I see people online all the time saying, Just finished Omori, and now I have to sleep in my parents' bedroom. And that climax gets screwy as well, but Lisa's is for everyone who isn't a finboy, and it left 16-year-old Lugo scar. I don't know if it will necessarily have the same effect on other people that it did for me, but regardless, I think it's best to play the game blind. There's a ton of cool, weird, and disturbing things to see here. So yeah, if you haven't played it, go play it. It's like 10 bucks on Steam, it'll take like 6 to 10 hours to beat, and thanks to the giant ensemble of party members and all the extra content, this game has so much replayability. Not to mention pain mode, the harder difficulty that makes it where you can only use each save point one time among other changes. Yeah, Lisa is one of my favorite games ever. There's not a dull moment in sight, it's got a great story with tons of interesting characters and replayability to ensure that I keep coming back. And you know, I'd even go as far to say that Lisa is better than Earthbound. And for something inspired by a game that was so influential to surpass it, in my opinion, that's amazing. <laughs>